Welcome everyone to, I think this is the sixth uh, part of the 25th uh, Midwest Computability Seminar. I'm very happy to have Li Ling Ko here, who's going to talk about fickleness and bounding lattices in RT. Okay. Um, um, thanks for inviting me. So um, uh, my talk is on fickleness and bounding lattices in the recursively enumerable hearing degrees. <coughs> oh, sorry. Uh, I have a bad voice too. Um, so um, the motivation of my work is basically I want to understand the relation between how the thickness of a, a recursively enumerable hearing degree is connected to its ability to bound a given finite lattice L. And if, um, if, it's, if the ability to bound a lattice L is only depending, purely dependent on the thickness of a degree. So, um, uh, so throughout my talk, can assume that all the degrees are recursively enumerable, and every um, uh, comparison that I'm making will be a Turing. Uh, every reduction of a comparison I'm making will be a Turing. Uh, I'm referring to Turing Turing degrees in the uh, RE set, basically. So I begin with a little bit of lattice theory, very slight lattice theory. So, um, what kind of lattice? Uh, so what do we know about lattices? So there are basically two types of lattices. There are the distributive lattices and the non-distributive lattices. Um, the non-distributive ones are exactly those that contain either a copy, one of a copy of uh, one of these two lattices here. Uh, one is n five pentagon, and the other is a, 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 a what called a one three one, or sometimes it's called m five. Um, it's a very thick diamond with one element at the top, three in the middle, and one at the bottom. So we know that these two are the troublesome lattices because any lattice that distributive lattices that do not contain any of these, um, they can be bounded below any non-computable Turing degree. So, but what do we know about bounding the uh, non-distributive lattices? So this is a summary of basically what is known. Um, so on the left here, you can see a few um, examples of non-distributive lattices. So for F8, for example, here has um, it's non distributive because you can see that we have the one tree one at the bottom, and then there are other um, there are other um, lattices such as uh, L twenty that contain the, um, the N five pentagon, and also other lattices like L seven and the one right at the bottom. They also contain a, a N the N five pentagon as sub lattice, and that's why they are distributed. They are non distributed lattices. So what do we know about these uh, and bounding the non-distributed non lattices? So uh, non-computable Turing degrees bound N5. Um, well, all non-computable Turing degrees bound N5. So N5 is very easily to be bounded. Um, and we also know that there are some non-distributed non lattices that cannot be bounded by the Turing degrees. And examples are S8 and L20. And we also know that there are some lattices that can be bounded by some uh, RE degrees, but not all of them. And the examples would be L7 and uh, 131. Um, so we can ask well, what makes a degree um, able to bound such a lattice. And we know that it's due to um, the property would be a thickness of the degree. So if you want to bound an L7, then you just need a um, thickness of exceeding omega. But if you want to bound a one three one, then you need thickness that is even much greater than that. We need thickness to be greater than or equal to omega to the omega. <clears throat> so for those who are um, more familiar with this topic, um, the L seven pretty much you can think. I, I like to think of it as just a critical triple, uh, but I don't want to introduce too many um, structures. So I, I like to think of the L seven and the critical triple interchangeably. Okay. So what do I mean when I say that? Um, uh, RE degree has a certain L particleness. So this has been defined by um, and introduced by uh, Downey and Greenberg. Um, so when an RE degree D um, has L particleness, where alpha is reasonably small, um, that is uh, below uh, epsilon zero, then we can first define what it means for a set to have um, alpha kind of thickness. We say a set is alpha computably approximable. Or alpha C A, if its thickness is less than or equal to alpha. So, as an example, 
you can say that the, the usual RE sets are just um, because you only you can put elements in, but you cannot take it out. So they they change their mind once. So the thickness is one, less than or equal to one. And the usual N RE sets are just the NCA sets. And uh, and this definition can be extended to the transfinite ordinals. Um, I'm not going to give the details of the definition because it's very involved, but basically you need the computable approximation to satisfy a few more nice properties before you can extend it to the transfinite, but basically that's a way to extend it. And so this is a set theoretic definition. So we want to look at a degree theoretic definition of uh, fickleness. So we say that a degree D is um, totally alpha C A or uh, with the fickleness uh, D is in T alpha. Um, if every set A in D is alpha C A. And we can also say that degree D is properly, um, properly T alpha or its fickleness is exactly alpha. If it's um, D alpha, sorry, if it is T alpha and it is not beta alpha, if, if it's not T beta for any beta less than alpha. So basically every set in D um, kind of has thickness less than or equal to alpha, but we cannot reduce this, um, we cannot find computable approximation that reduces that thickness um, less, less than alpha. <laughs> so uh, when this hierarchy was introduced, uh, it was introduced as a mind change hierarchy, but um, so throughout my talk, I'm just going to use the word thickness instead because I don't want to keep saying uh, make frequent mind changes all the time. So I just want to abbreviate to, to say thickness. So what do we know about this thickness hierarchy? So this thickness hierarchy, um, the things that we need to know for this talk, uh, it's basically summarized at the, the picture on the right. So very importantly, we know that the signal hierarchy collapses to um, powers of omega. And what, does, what that means is that if I give you any power of omega, like or omega cube, then I can find a degree d that has thickness exactly omega cube, and so on. And also, if let's say I have a degree d um, whose thickness is uh, omega cube plus 7, for example, then it's the, the thickness is actually just omega cube. We can always go descend down to the nearest um, power of omega. That means there's just a way to uh, find a computable approximation for sets in that degree, such that its thickness is uh, it's omega cube instead of omega cube plus seven. And we also know that um, every uh, alpha thicker degree is low two. Um, and we also know that some of them are low and some of them are non-low on every level of the hierarchy. So that's a summary of what we need to know for this talk uh, regarding the thickness hierarchy. So returning to it, uh, the connection with bounding lattices. So we know that L7 or the critical triple, it characterizes um, greater than omega thickness. And the 131 characterizes um, greater than or equal to omega omega thickness. And we also know that there are many levels in between. So there's uh, after omega, there's omega squared, omega cube, omega four, and so on. That um, we do, but we do not know if there's any characterization of any of the, of any of these levels. So my, in my work, I consider some candidate lattices for this the next level uh, above omega, which is the omega squared um, lattice. And I try to uh, look into what are the issues that we encounter when we try to find this omega squared lattice. So if you notice, um, so to begin my search for this candidate omega squared lattice, I looked at this um, these other lattices, this L7 and one two one for example, and they actually they actually have very simple structures. So you can see that they have they're kind of generated by three independent points. So for L7, for example, you have point A, point B, and point C, which are independent, and every other point is just either the joint or meet of all these uh, the three independent elements. So this point over here is just A um, meet B. This point over here is B meet C. And this point over here is A meet C. And the point right at the top here is um, A join C, or A join B, or A join C, or B join C. So, and you can say the same thing about 131. You can kind of generate it 
um, by just three independent points. So that's where I first began my search. I tried to look for, I exhausted the lattices that have all these, <coughs> that are generated by, uh, I wouldn't say generated, they have maybe three independent elements, A, B, C, and every other element is the joint or the meat of those elements. And you can exhaust them, and basically you can't find uh, anyone that characterizes omega squared. So right at the bottom, we have many lattices. Some of them are distributive, and they, they are very easily bounded below basically any non-computable um, RE degree. Um, and then we have the L7 that characterizes L7 that characterizes the omega level. And then we have the we have three other lattices apart from one tree one that characterizes the omega to the omega level. So what why what, what is it so difficult to find this omega squared lattice? So if you try to make some observations about um, these lattices, if you look at the four lattices that characterize the omega to the omega level, um, you realize that all of them have two or more meets that are the same. So for example, in this second lattice over here, if you call the middle elements A, B, and C, then we have um, A meet C is the same as A meet B. And the same thing for one tree one, A meet B is the same as A meet C, which is the same as A uh, B meet C. And similarly for this lattice over here, um, A meet C is the same as B meet C. Or as for like the um, L7, the lattice only has one important meet, which is just uh, A meet C, and there's no other meet that's the same. So basically, if you have uh, appropriate um, relevant join requirements, and you just have one meet requirement, then you will need uh, more than omega thickness. But if you have, if you add just one more meet requirement, your the thickness that's demanded immediately jumps all the way to omega to omega, and it's hard to see how it can how we think that omega squared um, thickness because we kind of need something that has more than one meat and less than two meat, which is a bit hard to imagine how that could look like. So to, to introduce this, um, to, to illustrate this, I, to, um, what I just said, we can see how we can basically bound an L7. Let's look at the main ideas behind bounding an L7 uh, lattice. So, the, or, or a critical triple structure. So we basically have the troublesome uh, requirements are um, the four, is four. We have a join requirement that says that A is computable by B and C. Another join requirement J C that says that C is computable by A and B. And a diagonalization requirement that says that A is not computable by B. And we also have a meet requirement that says that, um, well, we can uh, make it a minimal pair requirement that says uh, a and C is um, from the mineral pair, basically. So if we look at these uh, strategies individually, the JA strategy just basically says that if I want to put X into A, I want to put something small into B or C. And the JC requirement uh, strategy says that if I want to put something into C, then I have to put something small into A or B. So how does that interact with um, our D requirement or diagonalization requirement. So our diagonalization requirement says that I do not, um, A is not compatible by B and using the usual um, diagonalization strategy, we take a follower X and we wait for X to be realized. Then we want to restrain D so that um, X will not become unrealized. Then we want to put X into A so that um, we would satisfy the inequality at x. But if I want to put x into a, I have to put something small into b or c. Um, I cannot choose d because of the restraint that I have imposed on b. I, basically, I cannot put anything below c of x into d. So I'm forced to choose to put into a, oh, sorry, to put into c. But if I want to put something into c, then I have to put something into um, a or B, and once again, I cannot choose B. And I repeat the argument. If I want to put something into A, I have to put something into B or C, and I again cannot choose B, so I have to pick C. And then finally, we do, if we do this enough times, 
will be they will bounce between AC, AC, AC until we can bounce out of um, uh, beyond the restraint that was imposed on B. And that's where we can finally say that between A and B, I'm going to choose to target B instead. Because if I put stuff into B, I'm not required to put stuff into A or C. Or that there's no requirements that demand that if uh, we're looking at a critical triple uh, kind of construction. So basically, what this B strategy does is that it, it generates what we call an AC trace um, that is elements that need to be put into A and C respectively. And, and we know the length of this trace um, at the stage that X is realized. That's when that's uh, at the stage where X is realized, that's when we know the restraint that we're setting on B. And that's when we know how, how many times we need to bounce between A and C before it can bounce above the restraint. So that's a strategy for uh, to satisfy D. And then we can ask, why can't we just put all this um, A and C traces into, and make them all into A and C at the same time? Um, that's when we have the last requirement that gives us trouble, which is the, the M strategy, the M requirement that says that um, everything below A and C is computable. So the uh, M strategy is the usual minimal pair um, strategy. It basically just says, I cannot put stuff into A and C at the same time. I have to always put stuff, I always have to, I, can, I have to take turns to put stuff into A and C, and I always have to wait for this equality to return before I can um, alternate between putting stuff into A and C. So if the D interacts um, with this M, in, so because of this uh, M, M strategy, I cannot put the A C trace that I got from D uh, simultaneously. I have to do it uh, one at a time. And so each time I get uh, and write stuff that I need a permission, and that's why we need N permissions, and therefore um, N a thickness of N in order to finally satisfy the D requirement. And since n can be arbitrarily large, um, so basically we need omega kind of thickness in order to satisfy b. So this entire construction can be is usually viewed as a as a pinball machine, where the trace is um, an AC trace, is, so they are balls, and um, so an A trace would be a ball, a C trace would be a C ball. And the balls want to fall to the end, to the bottom of this uh, pinball machine, uh, but it's prevented by, from doing so by um, the gate, the the by an end requirement, which gives um, an uh, which gives an AC gate. <coughs> so this gate kind of opens and closes infinitely often, and each time it opens, only an A ball we cannot uh, allow A balls and B balls to fall through at the same time. So we have to basically. Um, uh, Wait for uh, wait well uh, 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 wait for the ball to fall through one at a time. So uh, as an illustration, at the bottom here we have an AC gate uh, given by the M requirement, and we have some um, AC ball sitting at the gate. So at the, so when the gate uh, when the gate opens, we can one of the C balls can fall through, and then while it's waiting for um, the the A ball can the, a ball next to it cannot fall through yet because uh, we're not able to anyway A and C at the same time. So, so we have to wait for the gate to open again, open again before the next A ball can fall through. Um, but while this, but while this, um, while this A ball is being, uh, while, while we're waiting for the gate to reopen, the A ball can be retargeted to uh, maybe a B ball. But it has to be retargeted to either a C or a B ball. Um, so that we can maintain the equality that A is comfortable by B or C, sorry, B, uh, B plus C. And then when it gets reopened, we can enumerate both balls in. And then we, we can retarget to a B ball again. And then we wait for the gate to open again. And then that's when we can um, enumerate the C ball in and then retarget to a B. And then we, fight, uh, until, and we repeat this process until finally the very first A ball is enumerated, and that's when uh, that's when the D requirement is satisfied. So that's how um, uh, one meets requirements 
will demand um, if it's paired with the uh, relevant joint requirements, then it will demand a fitness of greater than omega. So what happens if we have if we add just one more meet requirement, for example, in this lattice, where not only is um, the meet of A and C um, zero, we also want the meet of A and B to be zero. Uh, the usual, the first four requirements are the same as um, uh, what we had earlier. We're just adding one more new meet requirement. So what happens is that, uh, so this, what, this, what this new meet requirement introduces is an extra gate. So it's a so this new requirement says that um, A B forms a minimal pair. <clears throat> so we have an A B gate which prevents A balls and B balls from falling in simultaneously. And then we can look at how this changes the length of the traces that is going to be um, generated by uh, this requirement by a D requirement. So, so over here we have. Excuse me. Can I can I ask a uh, question? Sure. Um, so may I, I'm, maybe I'm missing something here. It sounds that what you, the description you just gave for the uh, one, one re meet requirement seemed yeah. to be an argument that said, oh, if you had a certain amount of fickleness, you could meet the requirement by getting enough permissions. Yeah. But I thought you were claiming that you had, a, you were proving, you wanted to prove that you needed at least that many permissions, that you needed at least that much fickleness to get it. Um, that's, a, that's a different, right? Am I mixed up here? Oh, uh, yeah, so, um, uh, uh, um, yeah, that's, that's true. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm really trying to um, give a description of where the fickleness comes about. So, um, if I want to, uh, so basically I'm trying to say that I cannot have less than uh, a thickness of omega, because if I have less than a thickness of omega, then um, then because I, I need I need that amount of thickness in order to for all the all the balls to fall to all the trays to fall through. Well, you're arguing that this pinball machine construction works if you have that much fickleness. Yes. Okay, I un understood the title to say that you you had you were going to prove that if you didn't have that much fickleness, you couldn't do it. What you say? One meet demands. So I'm uh, so I'm just trying to clarify what it is you're claiming. All right. Um, so I. Uh, so so the proof for why uh, if I don't have enough thickness, then I can't bond it. Um, it's. Uh, it, it's kind of based. The idea is also kind of based on this. The fact that we need we need uh, this. Uh, uh, the traces are of this this length. And so the proof of that is. Uh, well, it's. It's easier to illustrate the proof if uh, if we understand if we if I go through the pinball uh, construction. So it basically uses um, layers, some yeah. protection of layers. Okay. Is, uh, yeah, that is built on on top of uh, understanding this pinball construction. So yeah, I, I'm just the pinball construction is just to understand the underlying um, proof of that direction. Okay. Yeah, but I, I will not give that. I will not give the proof of that. Uh, of that. Of. Uh, of of that direction because it's uh, it'll be a bit too involved then. Yeah. Okay. I I, I I was worried that you were somehow doing. Yeah. Okay. So you 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 are thinking about a peeling off the layers proof. Oh yes. 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 Yeah, okay. Yes. Good. Thank you. Oh yes. Thanks. Yeah. So um, yeah, I'm just trying to illustrate where the layers comes about and um, yes. Yeah, so um, if we have two demand. Um, uh, if we have two meet requirements, then we're going to see that we're going to need uh, the traces to be a lot longer, and therefore we actually need a lot more thickness in order to um, uh, in order to satisfy requirements. So, for example, if we have um, this AT trace again, 
sitting on um, four different um, possible gates, sorry, uh, sitting on alternations of AC and AD gates. Then um, uh, I'm, going to, I'm going to illustrate what, uh, what kind of traces you get from this. So first, when the AC gate um, first opens, uh, a C ball can fall through, and then we can retarget to, um, to a B ball that does not grow. And then when the, a, and the gate opens again, both, both the A and B can fall through because it's a, uh, it's an AC gate that it allows AB balls to fall through. This doesn't allow A and C to fall through at the same time. And then um, when the AB gate opens, um, one of the B balls can the B ball can fall through, and we have to retarget uh, the A to an AC AC trace again. And so that's when the second um, trace is generated. And then um, <clears throat> so when the C ball and so when the AB gate uh, opens, um, the entire trace can go down to the next level. And then we basically repeat the process where a C ball falls through and then we target to a B and then A, B goes down and so on. So what happens here is that for every pair of um, uh, balls on, of our initial trace, it actually generates uh, a trace of length omega or less than omega. And so since like, uh, so altogether we need, uh, uh, since the length of this original trace is also less than omega, so altogether the length of the traces would be um, omega squared, less than, less than omega squared. And if we have, so that's what we get if we have two alternations of the AC and AB gate. So if we have K alternations, of those gates, then we will need um, omega k permissions, and and then we will, uh, that will demand. And since we can have arbitrarily many gates, uh, if we want to uh, enumerate the entire trace in, then we will need um, uh, omega to the omega permissions or thickness in order to satisfy this. Uh, in order to enumerate the uh, satisfy the d requirement. So that kind of illustrates um some of the difficulties in um, finding an omega squared lattice because if you just introduce one more gate, then the thickness that's demanded jumps immediately to omega to omega. It doesn't just go to omega squared. So there's, um, it's hard to imagine how we can find something that kind of works in between unless there's some different kind of um, algorithm that we can think of. So what questions can we work on? So um, Maybe we can try to find, given this um, pinball construction that I've just described, uh, we can see that there's actually many kind of, uh, there's a lot of freedom that we can work with that can give us also um, this uh, omega to the omega traces, uh, traces uh, to the length uh, less than omega to the omega. And maybe some of them would look different from um, any of the four, um, four lattices that already demands that, that amount of thickness. So for example, if we use the pinball construction on these requirements that have a lot more uh, degrees of freedom in terms of constructing the lattice to satisfy this and in terms of retargeting, then we still need omega to the omega thickness. <clears throat> if we illustrate using these gates, for example, so we have every possible combination of, uh, of um, every pair of gates, so every pair of elements uh, forms the minimal pair. Um, and every element can be computed by the join of the other tree. So if we have every, if we have two sets of every possible gate, and we have this AB trace sitting over uh, at the top, then how many, how long are the traces going to be when, uh, in order for a this AB AB trace to pass through all the gates? So when the first AB gate opens, um, the B ball can fall through, and then we can retarget. Um, to either a C or a D, we cannot retarget to a, D, a B again because we do, want, we do not want to get stuck at this A B gate. So if let's say we retarget to an A C A C trace, then at the next step we're going to get stuck at this at this A C gate. <clears throat> so maybe that's not a good idea since we have uh, other choices to retarget to. I, I don't want I don't want to get stuck so early. 
So maybe I would choose to retire it to an AD gate instead. But that would still get me stuck over here. So basically, if I want to retarget, if I want to get stuck at uh, as few gates as possible, then I want to try to retar uh, retarget to actually end a CD tree. Um, I, will, I cannot retarget to B anything with B because I cannot retarget to B anyway. So, so that would get me stuck at, the, at this CD trace, but at least I will not get stuck at this, um, at this AC or AD, AD gate. So when the gate opens, this entire trace goes in. And then we can get, um, kind of repeat the process. We want to, uh, after the D ball goes in, we want to retarget. And we want to avoid getting stuck at as uh, many gates as possible. Uh, so we want to retarget, um, but we cannot retarget to anything that contains a D. So these are out. So we can either retarget to A, B, or A, C, or B, C. And to avoid getting stuck so early, I'm just going to retarget to a B, C. <coughs> so this becomes a, a B, C trace. And then when the gate opens, um, The BC ball support through and then this process repeats. <clears throat> so uh, maybe we, also, we once again we need um, omega to the omega thickness if we have um, uh, more uh, many copies of these uh, six possible gates. And uh, and even though we have a lot of freedom in terms of retargeting, and also in terms of uh, more freedom in terms of designing a lattice that satisfies all these requirements, we still need. Um, Omega dot omega thickness to bound a lattice that satisfies this. So maybe we can ask a question that I think might be interesting would be um, if there are letters that satisfies those requirements that does not already contain any of the four um, uh, three point lattices that already give omega to the omega, um, demand omega to omega thickness. So um, for example, um, one for one satisfies those requirements because every pair of uh, AB, every AB or AC, basically every pair of the elements uh, meets to zero and A can be, and every element can be computed by the joint of the other tree. But uh, clearly the one for one already contains the one tree one, so it already demands that amount of thickness. So question is, can we, can we find something that doesn't look like that, that doesn't already contain one of these four? Uh, so I have, I have not been able to find um, such a lattice um, but there's still a lot of degrees of freedom to play with. So maybe we can, maybe it's, uh, there might be a lot of sets to satisfy that. Maybe we just need, maybe we need more than four independent elements. Maybe we need five independent elements. And then we will be, that will, <clears throat> hope, maybe that hopefully they will find us a new ladder that is different from any of the earlier ones, but still demand um, omega to omega frequency. Okay, so returning to the question of finding um, um, omega squared letters. Um, <clears throat> so one of the, some candidates lattices that I considered also was um, what can be considered as infinite lattices. So actually they are um, uh, upper semi, upper semi lattices, which I can, which can get by removing the meat of some of the lattices that were considered earlier. <clears throat> So uh, we can think of this as an infinite lattice because, for example, in L7, when we remove the meat, the A meat, C meat, then, um, then between every, uh, then if there's a degree that is below A and C, let's say um, D, there's going to be another degree above it and another degree above it and so on. So in that sense, we have an infinite <coughs> kind of ascending chain of um, uh, of elements, and that, and so in, in the certain sense, it's a little bit like an infinite lattice, and which I depicted by an open circle at the bottom. So we can ask does this change the amount of thickness that is demanded to bound a lattice without meat if when we remove it, when we force that some of the meat do not exist? And the answer is um, it, it doesn't change at all. Um, it still characterizes exactly the uh, the omega, the greater than omega levels of thickness. So how does the construction actually change? 
So we still have the same um, requirements that give trouble. Um, as, but the mix requirement is a little bit modified. And this time, instead of A C forming a minimal pair, we just need, um, in order to retain this structure of the lattice, we just need um, A and C to be computable by B. <coughs> and we also have a one um, new type of requirement, R, that says that the A, uh, the mix of A and C does not exist. So how does it change our construction? So the new M requirements, the M prime requirements. Um, so the earlier M requirement says that I cannot endure A and C at the same time. But the uh, M prime requirement says that I allow you to endure A and C at the same time. This, but you, you have to tell me, you have to endure B at the same time also. And the elements that you want to put into B it must be known early. Basically, it must be known uh, at the stage when <clears throat> we see a convert, uh, we see an equality between um, the A types and the C types of computation. So, can we use this new allowance to reduce the thickness that's demanded to satisfy uh, the requirements? Uh, the short answer is no. We still need um, uh, greater than uh, omega thickness. And that is because even though we allow AC injuries at the same time, uh, we also need to pick the B um, elements early. And we might need to pick the B before um, the follower that uh, uh, is associated with B is realized. So, um, and that will make, so when we pick, when we animate this very small B into B, uh, into, uh, into the set B, this may cause uh, the requirements to be unrealized. So, um, yeah, so basically we cannot, uh, even though this, uh, this M prime strategy uh, gives more allowance for simultaneous injury, um, we cannot use this to advantage to reduce the thickness demand. We still need omega greater than uh, omega thickness in order to satisfy the G requirements. So how about the, how about the, the non mix requirements are? So the R to G is, uh, we're pretty, we're, I'm following um, uh, Umbo species uh, strategy. So I'm mixing basically Umbo species strategy together with um, the pinball uh, machine strategy. And it says that, um, <clears throat> so if I'm, so in order for the mix of A and C not to exist, I'm saying that every time there's, uh, if there's some V below A and C, then there must exist some U that is um, properly above V, so that V cannot be the mix of A and C because V cannot compute U. So how do we satisfy this R strategy? So the main idea to take away from this strategy is that, um, well, it, it, it kind of follows the, a diagonalization kind of a strategy where we pick an X, a follower X uh, that's targeted for U, and then we wait for um, X to be realized, and then we want to put X into U. And we want to put it in such a way that um, uh, we will not cause this X to be unrealized later. And, uh, but we also have to make sure that this U is computable by uh, A and C. And so if we want to put stuff into U, we need to put something small into A and also into C at the same time. <clears throat> so um, in order for, the, for X not to be unrealized, um, this hypothesis that V is greater than A will eventually ensure that this X will not be unreal, uh, that we can lift the U, uh, lift one of the, the teacher users above what is the, uh, whatever use is required for realization so that when we eventually put stuff into A and C, uh, we will not cause X to be unrealized. So the main thing about R is that we have to simultaneously put stuff into A and C so that we can ensure that the set we're constructing, the use that we're constructing is computable by A and C. So how does that interact with the M prime requirement? So uh, M prime says that Okay, I allow you to put stuff into A and C, but you must put stuff into B, and that and that and that elements you put into B must be must be picked early enough. So, 
we need to check that R is able to pick this B element early enough. And it turns out that R can pick this element early enough because um, R does not actually set any restraint on B. The only restraint that R sets is on A. So, um, so we can we can we can indeed pick this B early enough, and then we can enumerate A, B, and C all into um, their target sets all at once. And so, just one formation enough, and so actually just dependence of one is enough. So basically, this R strategy does not actually um, even need much thickness at all to, um, to be satisfied. So similarly, um, we can consider what happens when we have another, or we remove the meat off uh, a, a two meat kind of uh, lattice um, that were considered earlier. So, in the, so the new requirements that we'll be looking at would be the M, the A, A B, the M, A, B gate that changes, which is that we also need um, everything that's computable by A and B to be computable by C. So that's the new requirements that's different from the earlier construction. And in fact, we can also make this, um, we can actually even also remove this um, B and C meet and we will still be the same. This letters that we get will still characterize uh, Omega to the omega synchronous. So here's the rough idea behind it. Um, similar, the same thing as before, um, we cannot reduce the thickness demanded by D because we cannot take um, the elements that allow simultaneous injury. We cannot take them early enough if we want to make sure that D is not got unrealized. But for the R requirement, um, now, now I have to work against two types of gates, which is the AC gate and then the AB gate. So R wants to put stuff into A and C at the same time, and the AC gate says you can do that if you put, you can pick um, B early enough. And so uh, R needs to put stuff into A, B, and C in at the same time. And the AB gate says if you want to put A and B in at the same time, you need to put some C um, that's been picked earlier also in at the same time. And we can, R can still do that. We can just choose the, the original C that was meant to be put, um, targeted into C, because R never imposed any restraint on C. So we can just enumerate all this in at the same time. And so a get a thickness of one will be sufficient to, um, to satisfy this R requirement. So what happens if we want to add even the, the last type of, um, Gate requirement, which is the uh, B C gate requirement, which basically just says that everything computable by B and C is computable by A. So if we add this last gate requirement, we get uh, what the lattice that we get is pretty much like uh, the structure of a one tree one of double meat. So what happens is that every the um, uh, the ideal that is generated below is um, A C A B or B C. Yeah, the, the ideal is actually it's, it's the same ideal that we get, uh, but uh, none, of, none of the pairs have a meet. So if we add this third gate requirement, then that's when our earlier strategy doesn't work because if we want to injure, um, uh, to work with AB, the AB gate, we need to pick C early enough. And to work with AC gate, we need to pick B early enough. Um, and to work with BC gate, we need to pick the A early enough. So basically what we're saying is that we need to pick both A, B, and C all early enough. Um, but this just doesn't seem like a straightforward way of, I can't see how it can be done if we want to, I feel like at least one of A, B, or C must be picked later if we want to avoid causing R to be unrealized. So the earlier strategy described basically does not work to satisfy um, this R requirement working against all three possible kind of gate requirements. So um, at this point of time, I'm not very sure how it can be done. So maybe maybe, maybe, it can, maybe this one tree one without meat cannot be bounded, or maybe it can be bounded. But just, we just need a different way to satisfy the R strategy that I'm not very clear how it can be done at this point of time. But if it cannot be bounded, then I think it will be interesting also because that will be maybe a new type of letter set cannot be bounded in the REDG. 
Um, yeah, and that brings me to the end of my talk. So thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Haley. Very nice talk. Um, are there any questions? I think people should just feel free to unmute yourself and ask. Yeah, this is uh, Manny Lerman. If uh, I were trying to uh, find something that was omega-2 fickle, greater than omega-2 fickle, uh -huh. uh, I would start with the greater than the omega fickle example. And then internally to one of the top sections, put in another copy of the same lattice. Um, so in the top section. Okay, draw uh, the. How do, how do you, uh, okay, so may, maybe I'll call this A, B, and C. Okay, draw um, the whole thing, the two lines going down. Uh -huh. And then uh, in the section from uh, that's bounded on the sides by B and C, uh, mm -hmm. put in the same, a copy of the same lattice. Oh, so, like this. Mm, um. I was thinking of going down from the top element. Um, In other words, having something going down from the top element between B and C. Oh, okay. All right, right. Uh, and then uh, going to the sides. Uh, either that side or, yeah. Right. Okay, so it seems to me from the construction that uh, what you're trying to do is uh, look at the repetition inside a certain interval and then, uh, I, I don't know how to say this, but, uh, but then repeat it uh, while you're trying to work inside that interval. Mm. So at any rate, uh, you can take this as a suggestion of something to yeah. try. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And yeah, that'll be interesting to look at. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Yeah. I think that look into this. Thanks. Are there other uh, questions or comments? So again, I want to see if I understood something. Are you saying that if a degree um, a bounds uh, two things which have no inf, then that A must be at least omega fickle? If a degree bounds two things that have no inf. Yeah, you, uh, you, when you have one non-meat requirement. I'm uh -huh. trying to understand what the, oh, um, the assertion if, is. If it's just one non-meat, then um, uh, it would just be uh no uh, so basically the non meats are dense so you, you actually just need anything non computable can uh right can, yeah bound a non meat so yeah um so basically the to for the non meat um we actually really just need one permission um yeah so but, why so why do you say it has more than omega fickleness Oh, that's because of the original D, the D, original D requirement. Um, the original D requirement is still still demands uh, omega fickleness. So. Uh, oh, from the other. Okay, not. Okay. Yeah, okay. yeah. So the the D original D requirement still um, still rem still re require uh, greater than omega fickleness. Um, yeah, even though the meat requirements are less uh, are kind of easier to meet. But um, we still cannot make use of that to reduce the fickleness demanded by the D requirement. Okay. So it's basically the rest of the uh, lattice structure that still requires that uh, fickleness. So the fickleness doesn't actually. So the the um, the R requirements do not actually 
contribute to any fickleness at all, like uh, apart from you just need non-computability. Yeah, no, yeah. Yeah. Sorry, do you have more, Richard, or are you good? Yeah, no, I, I just was, didn't understand the, the the title of the slide. I think so. Mm -hmm. it seemed to say just one non-meat requirement demanded a certain amount of pickleness. Oh uh, yeah, sorry, yeah, that's not um, yeah, I uh, yeah, that's a misleading title. Yeah, it's a misleading title. It's in the contents of the lattice that she's considering. Yeah, I didn't realize that. I mean, when I read it, I was trying to follow. Okay, that, that, it's, uh, as I suspected, I didn't uh, know what it meant. Well, I think I probably failed the link here since it wasn't very clear. And I listened to it several times. That's my fault. So. Sorry, we got it. Okay, Sarah. Oh, wait, I have another question. Maybe I'll, when you were looking at the elements that are generated by four mutual pairwise incomparables, uh -huh. okay, so there are uh, an awful lot of those lattices, like continuum many. Mm -hmm. So, did you think about trying to put on some other kind of restriction that would give you some reasonable finite family so that you could then actually check? Um, so yeah, so the restriction, I think if you, um, so I, the restriction that I get, like, it's kind of similar to this restriction for the three, uh, the three of them. So, um, I, I just want every element to be either the join or the meet of, um, those four of them. So it's either like, um. Oh, without repeating the, the, yeah, repeat the operations? Them. Yes. Maybe if I can get uh, A, A join B, join C, or uh, A join B, or A join C, or, uh, yeah, but I don't want, I don't, maybe I do not want um, A join B meet um, B join D or something, something like that. Maybe uh -huh. Okay, because yeah. So, yeah. So, in, I kind of stop at certain levels of um, uh, the complexity of like, the joint and meet. Yeah, okay. Otherwise, it's a hopeless task. Yeah, uh huh, yes. Well, but, it, it, but, if it, but if you cut it off, then there are only finitely many such lattices, right? Yes, yes, there are only finitely many such lattices. Yes. Uh, so then you could exhaustively check whether which of them contain a copy of one of the lattices you already know. Oh, yeah, exactly, yes. So, I mean, I'm sure you can write a program for that. Right, you should be able to write a program, right, that's what I was thinking. Yeah. You should be able yeah. to produce all the possible candidates. Yeah, I, I think that'll be interesting because um, then we might be able to find something that's different from 131 or any of these. Exactly, four. yeah. It yeah. should give you something to, tr to look at. Yes. Or, or tell you there aren't any. Mm -hmm. I was reluctant to let her program that. So, uh, if you put a small bound on the number of it of operations, it's not that big. And it's a computer, you know, it's like I don't know. Well, there's only so much time that we have to do these things. So, um, okay. 